Look at the new face staring at me. There's no Ryan Lavder this week. I assume he's still on a beach somewhere in Mexico drinking some sort of fancy drink with his family, and he's probably never coming back. So Brentley Romine joined me on this Monday morning. Thank you so much, Brentley, for joining me. We're going to get right to it in this writer's block. We're coming off of a very impressive victory for John Rom down at the Mexico Open. Brentley, which part of that victory impressed you the most? Well, Rex, uh, thanks for having me on. I think it is five o'clock somewhere for Lavender still, but uh, glad to be on. For me, it, it was just the fact that, and both you and I had talked to Rom in the past, the past couple of months, and even though he said there were no struggles, there were struggles, I think, with that putter, with that short game. It didn't look great, especially on the weekend, but the fact that he was able, wire to wire, no, it wasn't the best field, but just the fact that he was able to get back in the winner's circle and perhaps silence some of those critics. I thought that was probably the most impressive and what John Rahm is going to be um, most happy about as he moves into PGA Championship. Is that what you call what we do with John Rahm? We talk to him about his putting? Because I don't feel like it's a two-way conversation. You can ask him about his putting, and usually he spits at you or some sort of venom comes out of his mouth, and he just kind of walks around in circles like an angry dog because he doesn't want to talk about his putting. He's made it very, very clear that he's not going to talk about his putting. But I'm with you. It was the most impressive part. And look, this is a testament to how good his ball striking is, that he only needs an average putting week to win. I think Lav and I talked about this last week. I didn't need to see a win out of drum run, but I wanted to see a good week on the greens, and that's kind of what we got. He finished 18th in the field in strokes game putting, which is pretty much squarely right in the middle of the pack. It's worth pointing out, as you said, that the last two rounds he actually lost strokes to the field. On the green. So it's not as though he was lights out. It's not as though he did anything on those greens to make you think, oh, wow, he's Jordan Spieth, you know, the next version of that. That's not the deal when it comes to John Rahm. And again, this is a testament to how good his ball striking is, how well he can dominate a field tee to green that he doesn't need to do anything special on the greens. He only needs those average weeks. Now, going forward, I am kind of curious. If you look at world ranking wise, this was probably not the deepest field that he's ever going to face, go up against. And so it's probably not the best of indications of how, let's say, if we're going to spin it ahead to the PGA Championship or some of the other majors later on this season. I'm not quite sure how that fits into it. It was a resort course, but it's impressive for a lot of reasons, but mostly for his putting. So we're going to stick with John Rahm and we're going to transition to the PGA Championship, which is the next major championship that's coming up. Is he the favorite right now or is someone else on your mind? I think there's about four or five players on my mind, Rex. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, Scotty Scheffler, to me, is the favorite until someone else proves otherwise right now. I have Victor Hovland. I have Colin Morikawa. I even have a Justin Thomas ahead of John Rahm right now. And that just boils down to, again, the short game, the putter. Ahead? Yes. All right. Do what? I said ahead? You have Dust, yeah. uh, Justin Thomas ahead of John Rahm? All right, go on. Yeah, I do. Well, it's just because, yes, John Rahm right now ranks number one in strokes gain off the tee. But he's still well outside the top 120, 130 uh, in putting in around the green. And I want to go back to a point you made earlier, Rex, about this may not have been the toughest field he's faced. Well, he's won 13 times world right, worldwide, right? If you take away the, the gross victory at the Tour Championship, this was just the third high or third lowest point total um, in, in terms of winner's points in the OWGR for a win. The 2018 and 2019 Spanish Opens were both 26 and 24, respectively, got just 32. So no offense to Kurt Kitayama, Brandon Wu, but he's going to have to beat more than just those guys to win at Southern Hills. And right now, from what I saw yesterday, I mean, he couldn't really buy a putt. He made a couple nice ones, 14 for birdie, for birdie, 15 for par from about six feet. But, I mean, he, he couldn't make many putts, and I just don't think that bodes well going into Southern Hills. I've learned that when people say no, no disrespect to blank, whatever that, whatever your meaning was, you mean all kinds I love of disrespect Brandon Wu. to Stanford those two. Star, yeah, covered him in college. Uh, there it is. I knew the Great college player. stuff was coming at me like an avalanche. There, I knew I couldn't avoid that on the, any kind of writer's block with you. Uh, I, I would agree that he is one of the favorites because, you, again, going back to his ball strike, I can't imagine you show up at a golf course like Southern Hills, and it's been a minute since we've been there. But you're going to have to play well, certainly off the tee, and that's what he does really really well right now so you have to put him among the favorites I would probably put he and Scotty Scheffler right now 1A and 1B and I'm not quite sure how I'm going to cut those two up and, and put which where simply because I, I think Scotty Scheffler is just on one of those runs 
And I don't know that just because you win the Masters, that run comes to an end. We've seen it before, and eventually they do come to an end, but there's no reason to think that, oh, Southern Hills is sort of where Scotty Scheffler cools off. I, I don't know if that's the case at all. So you can make a good argument for either one of those guys. I don't know about putting JT ahead of John Rahm. I, I just don't know simply because JT hasn't played all that great in the major championships since he won his PGA championship. So I'm not quite sure he would be the guy that I'd put ahead of him. I might put a Jordan Spieth ahead of John Rahm because he's coming off a victory at Hilton Head just a few weeks ago. He's starting to look more and more like Jordan Spieth, and he's starting to get that look in his eye when it comes to the major championships that all of a sudden you know he's going to be in that conversation. Colin Morikawa is probably not one of those guys I'm going to put there either. So the list is pretty narrow as far as I'm concerned. But, yeah, I, I think John Rahm would have to be 1A and 1B. We're going to stick with the PGA Championship, and Tiger Woods made headlines, and Phil Mickelson made headlines last week when Tiger Woods flew to Southern Hills for a practice round. We're still not 100% sure that either one of them is going to play the year's second major championship. But who's more likely to play, Tiger or Phil or both? It's got to be Tiger, right? I mean, Does it? You, you said you're not 100% sure. I mean, I think it's mm. it's definitely in the 90s, right? I mean, he was just there. I mean, he was just there, played the practice round uh, with the head pro, flew straight to Tiger Jam, did a clinic, was playing poker, hanging out with Steve Aoki, uh, Larry Fitzgerald. I mean, to me, it, it seems if he was in any kind of severe pain, which to me is the only thing holding him back right now, I mean, he he wouldn't have done that. So he wouldn't have... Put, uh, put his body through that on the way to Tiger Jam, you know, along two days there in Las Vegas. So to me, Tiger's playing. I think it's almost a certainty. Phil, I'm going to let you take the reins on that because I would love to see Phil play. I'm curious to see what he would have to say if he would even speak to the media. Uh, but other than that, I have no idea. Uh, when it comes to pain and Tiger Woods, I think that we can just assume that that's part of the formula going forward. I know it looks like he's not in any pain, but based on what we saw, based on what I saw at the Masters, I think there's always going to be pain and pain to the point that he can't hide it maybe like he has in the past. That Walking four rounds around Augusta National was very, very difficult. It took a toll on his body, and I'm fascinated about how they put him back together again with duct tape and chicken wire and whatever it is back in South Florida that he and his group are able to, to piece the pieces back together and get it ready in a month. I think this is going to be kind of an indication of what the new norm is going to be with, with Tiger Woods because it's probably going to be a situation where he and his team are able to build him back up to where he feels like he can compete at a major championship. And then that week of the major, I think what we saw at the at the Masters being the primary example – is going to take everything away from him. It's going to just destroy his body, and he's going to have to do the process all over again. I think you're right. He doesn't get on Air Tiger and fly all the way to Tulsa for a practice round if he doesn't plan to play. So I am going to lead towards Tiger Woods. Phil is a much different animal. I'm not quite sure really where this lands because I'm not quite sure if he's mentally prepared to play competitive golf again. I'm not sure if he's physically prepared to play competitive golf again and we're talking about the defending champ and by all means this should be a different story than what it is but you're right he's going to show up at Tulsa and he's going to if he does he's going to have to answer some really uncomfortable questions and I don't think he's in anywhere near a position to do that right now I think there's still a lot of moving parts and when he what were his management company sent out the release last week that he signed up to play both the PGA Championship the U.S. Open and has requested a conflicting event release for the first Live Golf event in June in London. I, I think that is an indication that he's not 100 percent sure what he's going to do. But if I was a betting man, I would say he's going to live. He's going to lean towards Live Golf just based on his comments, based on his actions, and based on the idea that I don't know if there's a path back for him into the established world of golf. I'm not saying he never plays a PGA Tour again or plays a major again, but I'm not quite sure he can ever make it back into the fold. Well, and based on one swing video, apparently. Do you still think that was Phil? Was that Phil or was that was that someone else? Uh, I, I don't judge a man's calves, but those look like Phil Mickelson's calves. I mean, I'm not quite sure if there's calf recognition software out there or, or anything along those Should lines. Be. It, it looked like Phil's calves. So, yes, and it looked like someone who was trying to hit bombs. So all of the things, all of the cliches, all of the silly things that he's made popular over the last few years, it looked like him. Again, one swing of the driver doesn't convince me 
that he's ready to play. And I'm not quite sure if physical is the issue here. I think it's going to be more of a mental issue where he needs to prepare himself for not just questions from the media, and that's going to be a big part of it. I think internally what he's going to face in the locker room is going to be an issue, whether if he wants to address it or not. I just don't think it's going to be a situation that's going to be comfortable for him. And I know it's terrible to say because – Again, we should be celebrating what was an amazing accomplishment for Phil Mickelson when becoming the oldest major champion last year at the PGA Championship. And instead, we're sort of wringing our hands and some of us, I'm not saying I'm hoping he doesn't show up, but I think we can all acknowledge that if he does show up, it's going to be a zoo. So speaking of, we're going to transition like that from one zoo speaking to another zoo. Speaking of zoos, how does the uh, Grayson Murray-Kevin Nod dispute end up and i'm just going to fill in some real quick blanks they got into a, a twitter spat as most things that's the way it works out these days man stupid, spat you you prefer to man, call it man getting they got into a man spat on twitter which is pretty much where everything seems to start and then that spilled over apparently there was a confrontation last week between grayson and nine and essentially grayson made fun of kevin for being slow i know you stop me if you've heard this before and kevin made fun of grayson for being a bad golfer it, it's all very fascinating and again they went toe to toe by all accounts i'm not quite sure if we got the full story but how does this end well rex it ends by well, neither of us and all of us not talking about it anymore i i'm over these guys i'm not taking the side i think they're both in the wrong i think they're both acting like children kevin Na, your initial joke was not that funny Grayson Murray, your initial joke was not that funny. I, I thought Kevin Na came across a little bit as a bully in terms of getting on that podcast and bragging about just how funny his joke was. So like, oh, you know, I had all these people, you know, Brooks texting me that said it was really <laughs> funny. Like, you don't need to do that. Just let it go. Leave Grayson Murray alone. He, he's obviously has some issues. He's been in rehab, I think. He has a, a ton of things that are, that are going on that he's had to deal with personally. I'm not defending the guy, but just leave him alone. I mean, Kevin Knott's essentially dogging a guy that is already in the doghouse. There's nothing cool about that. Yes, we don't have the exact story of what went on on the range in Mexico, but Grayson, Kevin Knott, if they ever listen to this, just leave each other alone and just focus on playing golf because no one cares. Uh, I will point out that there is a timing issue here, and, and I, I kind of agree with the basic concept of that. let's leave Grayson alone because you're right. There's some things going on there. But Grayson started this. Not that it matters. I have kids, so I never really care who started it. But it was Grayson who sort of took the, the pot shot first. And you're right. It was a weird victory lap or weird flex for Kevin Na to sort of brag about how he went after Grayson because in this day and age where it's become so much more relevant to pay attention to the athlete's mental health for all the right reasons – I think everything that's happened really over the last year and a half, two years, has been an indication that we do care. The mental state of the athlete does matter, that this isn't about just how do you perform on the golf course anymore, that there does have to be an element that there's a person behind those golf clubs or behind that basketball or behind that mask. And you need to have some level of sympathy or empathy if you're Kevin Na or anyone else. I, I think both of them need a timeout because neither one of them are brawlers. Let's face it, neither one of them are really going to – this isn't going to – who would you Break take hypothetically? I, I'm Grace not taking Murray's either one of them. It's going to be a slap a fight. Boy. It's it's not. It's not. It's going to be a slap fight. They're going to push. They're going to shove. It's going to be you know just schoolyard nonsense. This is. I mean, if this is what 2020's version of Brooks and Bryson was, then I, I'm, I'm out. Digging. I'm out. Like I. I, I want 2023. None of this. I mean, let's bring on 2023. <laughs> there has to be a better version of this because simply it's kind of lame what they're sort of making fun of each other about. I know Kevin not plays slow. Like it's not true anymore. If you want to look at statistically, and it's not even a funny joke anymore. And as we pointed out, Grayson Murray, there's some there's some spots there. You probably shouldn't be going after someone in 2022. So I don't know. I, I think both of them just need a timeout. I think you and I need a timeout. That'll do it. You did well filling in for lab. I need a vacation. We need a vacation, both of us. You do. You need to go to the Bahamas. You need to drink. I, I would ask you what you're going to put on the grill, but I think that's Lab's thing. Anything on the grill? Yeah, I don't do a grill. I, I don't have a big enough uh, porch for a grill, so. All right, you're done. Go do it it. For the oh, that's even <laughs> better. You're done. That'll do it for this Riders Block. We'll see you later this week.